Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 29 of Advanced Linear Algebra. Today we're going to answer the question of which real matrices have a real spectral decomposition. Okay, in lectures 27 and 28 we looked at the complex spectral decomposition and we learned how to compute it and we saw that some real matrices, yeah, they have a spectral decomposition, but you need to make use of complex matrices, a complex diagonal matrix and a complex unitary matrix to actually make it work. Okay, so we're gonna see, well, in which situations can you avoid that extra technicality? When can you avoid using a complex unitary and a complex diagonal matrix in the spectral decomposition? Okay, in this first theorem, we're just gonna start off with the answer here, here it is. So suppose you've got some real matrix, right? You got some real matrix here. Well, then there's a real unitary matrix and a real diagonal matrix such that A equals U D U transpose, if and only if A is symmetric. Okay, so this is the exact same as the complex spectral decomposition that we saw a couple lectures ago with a couple minor tweaks. So first off, U and D, they're real now instead of complex. We used to have U star over on the right here, now it's just U transpose. Well, U star is U transpose because U is real now, okay? And then the final tweak is that this happens if and only if A is symmetric, okay? For the complex spectral decomposition, remember the condition was that A had to be normal. Now it's symmetric instead of normal, okay? So this tells us that there's a bit of a gap. If your matrix is real and symmetric, yeah, you can find a real spectral decomposition. But if your matrix is real and normal, right? Remember that means A transpose A equals A A transpose. Well, then those matrices, they still have a spectral decomposition, but not one that only makes use of real matrices. So that's the difference. Okay, so we're not gonna prove this theorem here in this lecture, but I will try to give you a rough idea of why it's true. Okay, if you want a complete proof, of course it's in the textbook, but let's go through sort of a rough idea and to give you a bit of intuition for what's happening here. Why, why is real symmetry the key that gets us this real symmetric, or, or sorry, real spectral decomposition? Okay, so to convince ourselves that something like this should be true, we're gonna show that the eigenvalues of every Hermitian matrix, they're all real, okay? And in particular, that's gonna mean that if your matrix is real symmetric, then all of its eigenvalues are real as well because real symmetric matrices are Hermitian. Okay, so to convince ourselves of this fact, suppose that lambda is just any old eigenvalue of a Hermitian matrix and let V be a corresponding eigenvector. Well, what happens then is, well, if we compute this little dot product here, okay, and I'll get to why we're computing this dot product, short answer is just, it's gonna work to give us our answer. Well, if we compute this dot product V dotted with AV, because our matrix is Hermitian, when we pull it over to the other side of the dot product, nothing happens. Remember the defining property of the adjoint or the conjugate transpose was that you can pull A over to the other half of the dot product and it's gonna become an A star, right? But because A equals A star, you just get the exact same matrix, whether it's on the left or right half of the dot product, okay? So that's the step right away where we're using Hermitianness of A or Hermeticity of A, I guess. All right, now we're gonna expand out both of these sides. We're gonna simplify both sides of the dot product here a little bit, okay? On the right-hand side, we're just gonna use the eigenvalue equation, okay? So AV becomes lambda V. And same thing on the left-hand side. Here we're just using, well, this AV becomes a lambda V because of the eigenvalue equation. And now we're gonna simplify both of those, again, going towards the outside, okay? Here, lambda V dotted with V, well, when we pull a scalar outside of the first component in a dot product, we get a complex conjugate over top of it, right? So this lambda gets pulled out as a lambda bar. Whereas over here on the left-hand side, when we pull this lambda out of the second component of the dot product, we just get lambda itself, right? It's linear in the second entry, but only conjugate linear in the first entry. Okay, and now if we trace through what we've got here, we've got lambda times v dot v equals lambda bar times v dot v. And because V is an eigenvector, we know it's a non-zero vector. So we can divide both sides by V dot V. That's gonna be a non-zero number, right? V dot V is a number and it's non-zero because it just equals the norm squared of a non-zero vector. Okay, so divide both sides uh, by V dot V, which is the norm squared. And we're just gonna see that, yeah, lambda equals lambda bar. And then if you think about what that means, like remember, remember complex conjugation that reflects a complex number through the real axis, axis, right? So the only way that a number can equal its own complex conjugate is if that number actually is real, okay? And because lambda was an arbitrary eigenvalue of this matrix, we, can con we conclude that, yeah, all of the eigenvalues of every Hermitian matrix and therefore of every real symmetric matrix, well, they're all real. Okay, so that sort of tells us that the D piece in the spectral decomposition is gonna be real, right? I mean, remember the way that you construct the diagonal piece, the D, is you throw the eigenvalues of the matrix A along that diagonal. There's still some extra work that has to be done to show that U can be chosen to be real as well, 
that's gone through in the textbook, okay? That's a more technical argument, okay? But if you sort of trace through the idea here, what you see is we get sort of three different types of spectral decompositions, actually. We get a complex one, we get a real one, and sort of an in-between one, okay? So let's do a little table here where we sort of catalog different types of matrices on the left and the type of spectral decomposition that they get on the right here. Okay, so the first type of matrix that we saw that was related to the spectral decomposition, these were normal matrices, right? Matrices satisfying A star A equals A A star. And the type of decomposition, type of spectral decomposition that they get is just, well, it's a decomposition with D and U both having potentially complex entries. All right. Now, the next one sort of suggested by what we did up above is if you consider Hermitian matrices, so matrices for which A star equals A, well, we just argued that the eigenvalues are real, so we can choose the D piece in the spectral decomposition to be real. So for these matrices, your spectral decomposition that you can get, you can get a D that has all real entries, and you can, but you still might have a U that has complex entries, okay? So that's for Hermitian matrices. All right, and then finally for real symmetric matrices, right? This is what the theorem up above on the same page concerned. Okay, if you have a real symmetric matrix, then you can go one step farther. Now, not only do you have D being real, but you have the unitary matrix U being real as well. So you get a little bit further, you get an even more real spectral decomposition. Okay, and in each of these, it sort of tells you what types of numbers are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, okay? For normal matrices, well, you've just got complex eigenvalues and complex eigenvectors. For Hermitian matrices, you've got real eigenvalues, but potentially complex eigenvectors. And then finally, for real symmetric matrices, you have real eigenvalues, but also you can choose your eigenvectors to be real. Okay, so let's think about this geometrically. What does this tell us, the real spectral decomposition? Well, it says that we can think of real symmetric matrices in a very nice geometric way, right? If we go back up, what does the real, uh, real spectral decomposition tell us? It tells us that every real symmetric matrix can be written as you know, a product of three matrices. In other words, a composition of three linear transformations, right? And what does the first one do? Well, the first one is U transpose. That's a unitary matrix. We think of it as sort of just rotating or reflecting space. And then what's the next one do? It's D, it's a diagonal matrix. It just stretches along the coordinate axes. And then what's the third one do? It's just U, it's the inverse of U transpose. So this one, it just rotates or reflects back in the opposite way from what U transpose did. It sort of undoes the original reflection or, or ro original rot uh, rotation, okay? So if we sort of look at this geometrically, what it's doing is it's rotating space, and that's stretching along the coordinate axes, that's the D part in the middle, and then it's rotating back, that's the original U matrix at the start. Okay, so let's draw a picture here of what a symmetric matrix is doing to Rn, okay? So if we just start off, here's my picture of, well, I can only really draw R2, so here's a picture of R2, okay? I've just highlighted the standard basis vectors E1 and E2 because I'm gonna sort of focus on what happens to them, right? The, the columns of A determine what happened to these two vectors here, okay? Well, if I break it up into pieces, the first thing that's happening is U transpose or U star. Okay, and that's just a unitary matrix, so it's just rotating and or reflecting space. So it does something like this. I've just taken this space here, and I've just sort of rotated it counterclockwise by four, roughly 45 degrees to get this picture over here. Okay, so the first standard basis vector just got rotated, and then the second basis vector just got rotated, and then this sort of square grid over here just turned into a rotated square grid based on these two vectors here. Okay, so that's what U transpose or U star does. It does something like that. And then next, we stretch along the coordinate axes, right? We apply a diagonal matrix D, okay? So here, I've drawn it with it sort of squishing in the X direction a little bit, sort of squeezing in in the middle, and then stretching out along the Y axis, okay? So this sort of square grid got stretched into a parallelogram grid. Okay, so that's what D does. It does something like that. Just stretches along the coordinate axes. And then finally, you apply the inverse of U star, just U itself. So this is, again, it's a rotational reflection, just back in the opposite order. It undoes what you did. Okay, so this time, now I'm rotating by roughly 45 degrees clockwise. So I just take this picture and rotate it back. Okay, so I can think of this as doing three separate linear transformations that each individually are sort of very easy to understand geometrically, or I can think of it as just, you know, it's just doing all of them at once. I can go straight from this original picture through A itself to this final picture over here. Same thing, but it's really nice being able to break down matrices into simpler matrices like this. Okay, so that'll do it for lecture 29. I will see you soon for lecture 30 when we start talking about week eight's course notes, when we start talking about positive semi-definiteness.